Welcome, everyone. My name is uh, Brian Haynes. I uh, work for Fluxion Biosciences on the uh, Bioflux product. And um, I'm um, really excited to uh, share with you our updated product offerings that we have. Uh, real briefly, I'm going to just uh, go over a couple basics about the Bioflux and then go right into those details. Uh, Fluxion was founded in 2005 as a startup out of the uh, San Francisco Bay Area. And uh, we've got worldwide distribution right now. Uh, previously, we, we were awarded uh, five NIH uh, grants, and more recently, we've applied for several more. And we're a three-time winner of the R&D 100 award uh, for the Bioflux, the Ionflux, which is an automated patch clamping system, and the Isoflux, which is a system for isolating uh, rare cells, um, particularly circulating tumor cells. All of these systems um, have uh, one central theme in common, which is uh, microfluidics, and using microfluidics to address unmet uh, medical research needs. The Bioflux system uh, allows for physiological uh, cell-based assays that are dynamic as opposed to uh, those with um, in static conditions. So principally, uh, fresh media perfuses over samples, whether these be biofilms, uh, cell biology samples, um, and allows for multiple experiments to run at the same time. Most of you are all aware of this. Um, if you are completely new to the Bioflux product line, uh, I invite you to, to check out our earlier webinars or to uh, reach out to us directly, and we'd be happy to explain the system further. The basis of the Bioflux technology is something called uh, microflu uh, well plate microfluidic technology. And principally, pneumatic positive air pressure pushes liquid from one side to the other. And depending on the, the structure, the architecture of the plates that are, we are using, um, it allows for controlled shear stress. Typically, the bottom of the Bioflux plate has always been glass. Uh, that's changing now with these new product offerings. But the same principle applies that a microscope uh, comes from underneath of the, the plate and allows for uh, real-time imaging. The, the basic channel characteristics uh, predominantly have stayed the same, though we have expanded our offerings into do different um, uh, plate formats. But essentially, you have an inlet and an outlet. And in the middle, you've got a viewing area. In, in this case, you've this is uh, two independent flow cells with uh, what we call a defined shear region or a, uh, a viewing channel. And in the case of the 48 well plate, we have 24 independent flow cells. And with the 24 well plate, um, this has two inlets and one outlet. And so that provides for eight um, independent flow cells. However, the uh, 24 well plate has a um, essentially a liquid handling function where you can control the different inlets at, at different times or at the same time. The basic operating principle is that liquid is applied onto the microfluidic plate. Uh, an interface attaches onto the top, allowing for positive air pressure to push the liquid from one side to the other. Cells and reagents can be introduced, medias um, and drug treatments, simply by putting them into either the inlet or the outlet and applying uh, air pressure. Uh, the three products we're going to cover today, the, the, the new offerings, are the all silicone uh, PDMS bottom plates, uh, custom substrate plates, and uh, dual gas flow. Uh, I'm going to go over these basics, and then I'm going to introduce um, Dr. Esther Kanakanakan and uh, Mr. Nathan Blood at the University of Sheffield to go over uh, a product update with the PDMS bottom plates and some preliminary data that they've started with. Silicone. PDMS has been used in catheters, <coughs> excuse me, or other medical devices such as stents and um, uh, other types of um, tubings and manipulations for about 20 to 30 years. Uh, PDMS is considered to be a, bio uh, a biocompatible polymer. The, the limitation with these, however, has been that uh, in the case of, for example, uh, urinary catheters, they become infected. And the issue with uh, cardiac, either stents or catheters, is that they become endothelialized. And so 
this um, having a substrate instead of glass that cells can adhere onto uh, to study it is um, valuable to our um, our community, either of the biofilm community or the uh, platelet cell biology community. The typical structure of our uh, bioflux plate, as you saw before, was that the top is a well plate and the, the middle section has traditionally been a PDMS or silicon that provides the architecture of the microfluidics. And the bottom has been 170 micrometer cover glass slip. The, the reason for that was relatively simple that we, <coughs> excuse me, as an imaging product, we wanted this to be, uh, uh, to have the best optical clarity. And most microscope objectives are set to uh, 0 0.17 millimeters, 170 micrometers, or what they call a number 1.5 cover slip. The, the new silicon bottom plates, um, instead of using glass, have a, a 250 micrometer layer of PDMS. This is still optically clear, and you can image on this pretty well. The, the reason we had to make this thicker is because of the elasticity of the PDMS, that if we did any thinner, um, it has too much give in it. And um, so it was a compromise of, of thickness versus of stability, uh, so clarity versus stability. Here's a brief example of, of some data we collected using uh, these all silicone bottom plates um, to grow in the uh, case of panel B here. This is uh, Pseudomonas and E. coli, which is really is a safe bet that Pseudomonas and E. coli will, will populate a biofilm. And in the bottom panel here is uh, Staphylococcus aureus in its early stages. And I have a brief video to show you of um now this is real time imaged every uh 20 minutes of e coli and pseudomonas this is grown in um, human urine so uh, a nutrient poor media and the the goal of this of course was to show uh what would happen in a uh, catheter uh style biofilm that would be attaching to um you know a patient The second offering that, that's new is what we call the custom substrate plates. One of the biggest limitations that Bioflux had in the past 10 years was um, that our plates had a glass bottom on them. And uh, people who wanted to use what they call custom coupons that modeled after, for example, the CTC reactor, uh, sorry, the CDC reactor, um, we couldn't do that because we had a glass plate. The other limitation was that people who wanted to cut out the material, um, and actually this gives, gives back actually to the, the PDMS bottom plates, uh, people wanted to cut out the material and, for example, uh, section it for um, uh, electron microscopy. It wasn't really a, a practical thing to cut through glass. So the electron microscopy aspect got addressed with the PDMS bottom plates. And the custom substrate plates have addressed this coupon issue. So instead of having a PDMS on the bottom, there's a hole in the PDMS uh, punched out and a custom substrate can be glued onto the bottom of these plates. There is a limitation, however, with the shear and we'll have a subsequent uh, app note to come up with uh, how you'll calculate the shear if you're putting a custom substrate here. In your handouts, we have the app notes for the custom substrate plates and the PDMS bottom plates. This is a basic schema of how these custom substrates work, where we essentially replace an area of the viewing channel with a, a minimum of a 10 by 10 millimeter uh, coupon. Um, I, Ideally, you want something closer to 14 by 14 millimeters. Uh, this can either be, a, in, for example, an alternative version of PDMS. It can be a cover slip that's been chemically treated, or it can be a, an opaque coupon. However, it would just be a little more difficult to, to image on that. Uh, but if you, for example, had a, a piece of porcelain that you wanted to grow a biofilm using the Bioflux technology, you could do that now. 
and then later remove the porcelain and um, and then evaluate the biofilm structure that's on it. This is an example of growing uh, E. coli on a custom substrate that a customer provided us. Um, we're really fortunate to do this. It's not the cleanest image. However, we, we were clearly able to show a development of the E. coli biofilm on this and enough of a proof, proof of principle to move forward, um, both with the um, uh, potential customer buying a system and for us in the product offering. And we look forward to um, much more data down the road. To understand this last offering, which we call the, the dual gas flow, it's important to understand what the 24-well plates do. The 24-well plates allow for uh, two different inlets, um, inlet A and inlet B. In this case, you can either perfuse media or, or, or drugs or compounds from inlet A or inlet B, or you could perfuse them at the same time to allow for what they call a laminar shear flow. And it, this is a graphic schemata of if you had a red media in A and a green media in B, that you would perfuse them at the same time and you would see in the same flow cell, the red media at the top of the channel and the green media at the bottom of the channel. Depending on how fast you perfuse the media would dictate um, how much mixing you would have in this sub, sub layer. And this was originally used for um, uh, chemotoxis related to, uh, say, for example, neutrophils or uh, brain stem cells um, or, or brain tumor cells that we, we've seen before. More recently at Oxford, they described uh, using this for bacterial chemotoxis um, towards uh, things like endogenous um, pyosins and whether or not um, bacteria would be motile towards uh, different um, chemical agents. Another example is for, um, for example, using it for, for compound profiling. Uh, this is a early stage Pseudomonas biofilm that has backlight on it where uh, green is alive and red is dead. And the, the bottom of the channel is water and the top of the channel is one ppm of hypochloride. Um, when you increase that to 10 ppms, um, in the same channel, you see uh, a clear killing at the top versus um, a, a viable uh, colony of bacteria at the bottom. The idea behind the, the dual gas flow was that to, uh, the system is defaulted to room air. We can override that room air with a custom gas mix. Oftentimes people will want to use, for example, 5% CO2 with a balance of room air or 95% nitrogen with 5% CO2. People have asked in the past, what if we were able to do one gas in one inlet and one gas in the other inlet? And, and so that's what we've done here, where one inlet can have, for example, a gas perfused over top of the media that has a low amount of oxygen and one perfused over the other side of the media that has a high amount of oxygen. And that would help model the, the type of environment that you would see, for example, in the mouth, where you've got a, a different gradient of oxygen going from one side to the other. Um, it is important, however, to uh, sparge or, or, or bubble your media in advance of, um, of doing this with the gas that you're looking to do. Um, and now it's my pleasure to introduce um, Dr. Esther Kanakanakan and um, Mr. Nathan Blood. Uh, Esther was a, um, is, is a lecturer of chemical and biological engineering at the University of Sheffield, where she finished her PhD and her postdoc. Uh, she's now the core director of the Sheffield Antimicrobial and Biofilm Corps. Um, she was the first to coin the term biofilmology. And, um, Mr. Blood is a uh, PhD student in her lab and is working towards um, his doctoral degree at this moment. And so it's my pleasure to turn it over to them to explain their early data with these uh, PDMS bottom plates.
Hello everyone. Thank you for attending the webinar today. Thank you also to Brian Haynes from Fluxion Bio Biosciences and Andrew Ridley from LabTech, the UK distributor for Bioflux, for inviting us to present this webinar. Today I hope to share with you an overview of how we are using the Bioflux 1000Z platform for studying medical device associated biofilms. First, I'll present an overview of the research in my group and uh, within uh, SCARUB, which is the Sheffield Centre for Antimicrobial Resistance and Biofilms. Uh, and later on in the presentation, you'll uh, hear from Nathan Blood, who's doing a PhD investigating the formation of Proteus mirabilis biofilms in urinary catheters using the Bioflux 1000Z. So, who am I? Um, I'm a lecturer at the University of Sheffield. Uh, Sheffield's a city at the heart of the UK. Uh, it's quite a, a, a hilly city uh, and it allows us to take nice pictures of the skyline, as you can see in the picture uh, on the sort of the top left corner. I work in the Department of Chemical and Biological Engineering. Uh, it is the building that you can see at the bottom left hand corner. Um, Although I work in the chemical and biological engineering department, uh, my training uh, originally is as a molecular microbiologist, uh, which means that I'm extremely interested uh, in studying the physiological pro processes in microorganisms. When I started my um, career in academic research, I was investigating the impact of microorganisms within industrial processes. So microorganisms are everywhere. So um, it makes absolute sense that they are present in industrial systems as well. However, their impact is often overlooked. Uh, and as a result, we are often unable to put in place effective mechanisms to mitigate their negative impacts and enhance their positive impacts. So when I started on this re research trajectory, I was quite taken aback when I realized that uh, bacteria or indeed any other microorganism uh, preferentially live uh, in clusters called biofilms um, on, the surf on many surfaces. And these biofilms, um, although they are quite hardy, uh, they are actually affected by and they actively adapt uh, to the conditions uh, in all environmental uh, niches, uh, specifically those in industrial environments. So since 2007, uh, I've spent time um, studying biofilm behavior in many different organisms. Currently in my research group, we are investigating um, the design uh, and the production pipeline uh, and validation for anti-biofilm products, particularly for the healthcare se sector. This is quite an ambitious undertaking. Um, and so in Sheffield, we have assembled a team with uh, quite cross-disciplinary ex uh, expertise. Uh, we are bringing together scientists, uh, clinicians and engineers uh, under the umbrella of, of the Sheffield Collaboratorium for Antimicrobial Resistance and Biofilms, uh, which is an Innovate UK funded um, enterprise, not only with the cross-disciplinary ex uh, expertise, but also with laboratories fully equipped to study biofilms of clinical uh, interest at all relevant conditions especially at the host pathogen interface. Um, so the Bioflux uh, 1000Z that I'm going to talk to you about uh, is very much uh, one of the core expertise that we have uh, within SCARUB. Uh, and at SCARUB, we reckon that understanding fundamental biofilm behavior enables us to design novel products um, specifically for looking at biofilm control. So what is our uh, research ethos? So we started with the thinking that for a biofilm to form, we really need two main elements. Uh, one is the surface that they form on, uh, and the next is the microorganisms that form a part of the biofilm. So in addition to this, um, the development of a biofilm is very much influenced by the environment around it. So the conditions uh, in terms of pH, uh, or flow, um, or the nutrients that are present, present in the environment all dictate how a biofilm will develop. Uh, will develop. So um, so when I, was, when I started on this research, um, I, I was quite aware of the fact that these environmental conditions play a huge role. Uh, and I was quite um, taken aback um, to see that in the literature, traditionally biofilm research uh, 
has tended to focus only on a particular aspect. It's either the microorganism itself uh, or en the environment or, um, or looking at antibiofilm surfaces. So this sort of approach has yielded a lot of in insight into biofilm behavior and it is um, extremely essential. But within Scarab, we believe that in order to translate our know-how about biofilms into actual effective products, uh, that control biofilms, we have to take a much more holis holistic perspective. Uh, what I mean is we have to look at the effect uh, simultaneously um, of the surface uh, and the external um, environment on how the microorganisms within the biofilm behave. This is particularly important because the products that we are uh, developing, we want them to be effective uh, under its in, um, under the natural environmental conditions that we're, where we might encounter biofilms. Um, and any difference between the laboratory conditions and the conditions in the particular environmental niche would actually have quite unpredictable effects on the products that we are developing. So for within the research in Scarab, um, quite precise environmental control uh, is necessary and it's quite important to us. Um, and that really uh, brings on to why uh, we have invested in a Bioflux 1000Z because as you can see from the picture this is the system that we have uh, in our lab um, so the Bioflux 1000Z is, uh, is a fully integrated platform so we have the microfluidic technology that uh, Brian um, explained earlier but this is uh, the, the entire uh, the platform is mounted on an inverted uh, microscope and around this inverted microscope uh, we have built an environmental chamber which allows uh, precise control of um, the temperature, uh, the humidity uh, within this chamber uh, as well as the atmospheric composition. Uh, it, all of this is uh, in addition to the flow rates uh, that we can control using the Bioflux technology. Um, so, um, so we are using this uh, to look at all of these three aspects, uh, looking at uh, different surfaces, uh, looking at um, how the different environmental conditions uh, influence the biofilms, but also the real-time capability, uh, the real-time imaging capability offered by Bioflux allows us to study sort of intracellular processes in situ uh, within the biofilm. Um, so with the ability to, uh, to create custom surfaces that, bio, uh, that Fluxion Bio is now offering, uh, it makes this 1000Z uh, really useful to us uh, within Scarab. So at the moment, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Nathan Blood, uh, whose uh, PhD project is looking at um, Proteus Mirabilis biofilms uh, in urinary catheters. He is using the PDMS bottom plates that um, Brian, um, uh, hinted at, uh, and um, he will, Nathan will be presenting his preliminary results. So, <clears throat> sure. Thanks. Um, so I'm just going to start by giving a, a brief introduction to the project that I'm working on, and then I'll go on to show some of the results that I've obtained with the Bioflux uh, using the PDMS plates. So urinary catheters are used widely in healthcare settings. Uh, there's an estimated one to two million people in the UK using urinary catheters at any one time uh, and the majority of these are the uh, silicon based folly catheter um, now the physical design of the folly catheter really has remained largely unchanged since the 1930s um, and it, it carries a huge infection risk although it does the job um, there's a, a five percent daily risk of infection for um, each day uh, of catheterization which rises up to after one month um, 95 percent of patients undergoing this long-term catheterization will experience uh, a urinary tract infection of some kind um, which is a huge problem uh, and uh, linked to these infections and issues with uh, folly catheter um, is this idea of blockage so up to a half of long-term catheterizations experience a blockage of the catheter um, and this is caused by bacterial buildup, biofilm development, um, and the formation of crystals, as you can see in this image. Um, and one of the biggest causes, one of the main causes, 
of crystal formation um, and encrustation and catheter blockage is Proteus mirabilis, uh, which is a gram-negative organism. It's found naturally in the gut flora. It's a commensal organism, but um, when it establishes an infection in a catheter, it leads to um, blockage. And the reason for this is it contains a potent urease enzyme, uh, which is constitutively expressed in urine. And the potent activity of this enzyme uh, raises the local pH, um, and this leads to the precipitation of calcium and magnesium ions and the formation of these crystals. And the image shown here is a, a crystal grown from artificial urine media with proteus growing inside the bioflux. So there's been a lot of solutions tested to try and uh, fix this problem. Uh, new surfaces, different designs of the, the catheter, adding antimicrobials, treating with antimicrobials, all that sort of thing. Uh, but none of them have been successful so far, or had any real um, success in that area. Uh, and our belief is that to solve this problem, we need a deeper understanding of the underlying mechanisms. Uh, we need a thorough understanding of how Proteus grows uh, in catheter flow environments, uh, how the urease affects the environment around it. Um, and then uh, from this, we want to build a computational model of the growth of Proteus, of the pH changes, um, the uh, enzyme activity, um, and then ultimately crystal formation, and use that to help prevent and treat biofilm formation in catheters. Um, so at the start of my project, we obtained a number of strains of Proteus mirabilis. Um, and because our aim is to create a reliable um, model, which is uh, realistic and representative of the catheter environment, we wanted to characterize the growth of these different strains um, and compare them to each other. In particular, we have a, a lab strain called NSM6. Um, and we wanted to compare this to some real world isolates uh, to ensure that we don't move forward with research using a uh, bacteria that isn't representative of the problem we're trying to fix. Um, and understandably, the PDMS plates are essential really to this comparison because um, we're looking to mimic the um, catheter environment as closely as possible. So I'm going to start by showing a, um, uh, a bright field time lapse video. Uh, I'm just going to pause it and explain what's going on before I play it. Um, so this is uh, using the Bioflux 1000Z. Um, these are um, 200 time magnifications of the viewing channels. Uh, we've got a few different strains here. So in the top left is NSM6, the lab strain that we've been using, which we obtained from um, uh, David Williams' lab in Cardiff. Um, we also have a urease negative mutant, which we're looking at. And then we've got a number of clinical isolates which were from the Northern General. So these are um, bacteria taken from patients who came in with, um, with the catheter infections, with problems there. Um, and so we're comparing these strains. This is using the PDMS plates, as I said, uh, in LB um, at first, because we're working on the artificial urine media. Uh, the temperatures uh, controlled at 37 degrees, humidity is controlled, and there's constant flow, uh, which is representative of the shear stress in a catheter. Um, and uh, these images that I'm going I'm to show you are um, top down, the flow is from left to right um, under this constant flow environment, and it's over 19 hours. So if I hit play, you should see that the uh, bacteria are building up over time. Um, there's a kind of a slight loss of detail as we're transmitting over the internet. Um, but when you're looking at these images, you can see a lot of details in there. There's a, a real distinct shift in morphology um, with Proteus. You see a change from um, swimming cells to swarmer cells, and they become much more elongated. And they have this distinct kind of stringy quality. Um, you see that really clearly, as well as the formation of these kind of thicker structures. So down here on, on uh, in channel number one on the kind of near wall, there's a thicker structure there, a biofilm forming. Um, and uh, there's also kind of a, a flow environment, a flow channel forming in channel three as well, um, which you'll see a little more clearly in a minute. Um, the, uh, they're, they're really kind of neat videos. Um, they, these are taken directly from the Bioflux software. They're created in the Bioflux software, um, and they're really easy to pull out. And um, as I say, you can get a lot of information, I think, from these time lapses. So I'm going to move on. 
the uh, next videos I'm going to show are using fluorescence. So um, rather than the bright field I showed before, these are using a, a cytonine, so a live cell stain um, as part of a, a live dead cell stain kit. Um, so it emits at around, binds nucleic acid and emits at around 500 nanometers in green region. Um, and uh, we have uh, green and red filters on our system, although I believe they are interchangeable. Um, so these are the same runs as before. On the top left, we've got NSM6, the lab strain. Number two is a urease negative mutant. And then the, the same clinical isolate, um, on, uh, number three on the bottom there. Um, and they're growing over 19 hours again. It's kind of a low contrast at the start, but then as the uh, cells grow, you see this, they brighten up. Um, and you can really see some of the definition now again. In number one, you've got the, the formation of this higher structure at the bottom. Um, and then you can really see, I think, on number three, this uh, flow region through the middle. You've got kind of a biofilm forming at the bottom and at the top, so on the bottom left and the top right, and then this flow through the middle, um, which you can see as the, uh, the, the swarmer cells elongate and, uh, and you see the flow through there. Again, we can um, view these in much higher detail on the Bioflux, draw out um, some more from there, see these morphological changes and the appearance of these higher order structures. Um, the next thing I want to show is uh, another kind of feature of the software, which is the ability to pull out these graphs. Uh, these are um, created by using thresholding to detect the cells or the biomass as it appears um, and plot against time. So these were used, um, these were done taken from the bright field images I showed earlier, um, but they can be doing in fluorescence too, by thresholding either for dark against light or light against dark. Um, and uh, you know, they, you, you can see that they form these really nice growth curves. Uh, and I think it's immediately clear, that you can see differences between the growth of these different isolates. In particular, the NSM6, the lab strain seems to pick up growing quite uh, quickly compared to the other two. Um, by five hours in, you know, you've got good growth already, whereas the others take a little longer to get get going, um, but it plateaus much sooner than the isolate does. Uh, and the, the slope on the isolate is much steeper, so it grows much faster and continues growing further. You know, you've hit 75% um, growth in number three, whereas uh, number one, the NSM6 has plateaued just above 50. Um, so as I said, these were generated using the Bioflux software, um, pulled out using the, the thresholding setting. Uh, and these data are uh, easily exported to Excel um, to be able to manipulate and uh, you know create custom graphs and that sort of thing. Uh, and they are really useful for, for uh, making these kind of comparisons and further comparisons. Um, and I believe that other parameters can be mapped as well using the graphs and using the, the, the capabilities in the software. This is just what I've found the most useful. The final thing that I want to show to you is a Z stack. Um, in the same way as automating the time lapse that I showed before, you can program the um, hardware to take images through the Z plane. Uh, and it's easy to set the distance between the slides. These images that are shown here um, are every half a micron. Um, this is under flow, the same flow rate as was shown before. Um, representative of the catheter environment. Um, this is at a higher magnification. The images before were used in a 20 times lens. This is a 40 times lens. So we get a little more detail coming through. Um, and this is a biofilm that's kind of grown over the 19 hours or so. Uh, you can see I've annotated this with a few hours and stuff to show the flow as it appears. Um, you can see, so this is from, as this loops around, you see the uh, images being taken from the bottom underneath the channel they come right through the channel and then fade out over the top. I'll play it again. Um, so from underneath, you start to see the, um, the thick layer of cells that coat the bottom of the channel. Um, and then up in the top left, you start to see a little bit of flow appearing and then it kind of moves down. Um, so you can see kind of the, as you see the flow appearing, I think you can almost imagine the biofilm spread out right over the bottom of the channel. Um, and these cells growing, and then as as we come through, as we um, increase the Z distance, you see flow appearing, and, and kind of this thicker structure appears in the bottom right that extends up into the channel um, and has kind of a, a good bit of height to it before we hit the top of the channel. 
there. Um, and I, I really love this video. It shows that um, kind of the detail that you're able to achieve with the integrated system that we have. Um, and it was quite easy to sell as well. Um, so that's everything that I wanted to show. Thank you very much, Nathan. Um, so um, just before we close uh, the webinar, I'd like to thank um, uh, our collaborators, uh, specifically Dr. Annette Taylor, uh, who's co-supervising Nathan uh, for during his PhD project. Uh, thank you to Innovate UK for funding uh, Scarab, uh, Professor Williams and his group for the uh, for the lab strains, the NSM6 and the mutants, uh, and Dr. David Partridge from the Northern General Hospital uh, for the clinical isolates. Uh, so um, thank you for listening, everyone. So we have one question uh, come in about the height of the channel, um, but I think that's referring to the custom substrate plates, which um, I think, Brian, you might be able to answer that for us. Okay, so I believe Brian has unfortunately had to leave the webinar, his computer's broken. Um, so I, I don't think we're able to answer that question on the height of the channel, but um, if you see the handout that's attached to this webinar on the, um, the, the app note for the custom substrates, um, that might be able to help answer your question. I'm sure if you email, they'll be able to sort that out for you. I don't know if there are any questions with regards to what we've shown today. If there are any other questions, um, I'm sure uh, Brian Haynes at Fluxian Biosciences is happy to uh, to answer them. Uh, if not, uh, you can send me an email. Uh, my address is just my name. Uh, it is e for Esther, e .karuna -karun, uh at sheffield.ac.uk um, so I can I can maybe perhaps type type my email address um, yeah, we'll pop it into the chat. Into the chat, and then um, uh, and then um, you can, you can send me any questions. Uh, and I believe um, we have an answer from um, Andrew Ridley, uh, the from Lab Tech, um, uh, regarding uh, the height of the channel. Um, the the channel height in the Custom bioflux plates are, are 75 mic micrometers high, uh, and um, I think if you have your, um, I think I'm right in saying that if you have your custom uh, surfaces, uh, it will be about uh, 200 uh, microns, uh, micrometers high. So, um, so on the chat function, um, oh. Uh, on the chat function, I'm just about to uh, share my um, email address. So if you have any further questions, uh, I will be happy to uh, help facilitate uh, an answer. And um, so we have a question here from Christian, um, which says, "What was the most challenging aspect for setting up these experiments on the first go?" <laughs> um, I would say that. I think really because you're working with quite small quantities or you it's a very precise um, system that you're setting up it's just really the the most difficult bit 
is just making sure that you are careful with what you're doing. Um, you know, and that um, you're very precise setting this up. Um, actually, the system itself it was quite easy to use. The well plate is um, very straightforward and, you know, it makes sense. So it's quite easy to set up different uh, runs or different um, setups within one plate. Um, and once, I think once you've set up a couple of runs, the whole system makes a lot of sense um, and it's, uh, it's quite easy to use. We're also dropping um, Brian Haynes' email into the chat, just in case you would like to send any questions his way. Um, if there are any other questions, please, please feel free to drop them into chat or into the questions section. I guess we'll hold on for uh, another minute or so, and then uh, we'll end the webinar here. Okay, we have a question. Do you find a difference in the imaging quality between the glass and PDMS? I would say the imaging quality um, is uh, is very much the same. I've found that the PDMS plates have a tendency to get dirty quicker, um, so you have to be a little caref a little more careful handling them um, because uh, because I guess the quality, the nature of the material um, it has a, a tendency to pick up dust and stuff sticks to it. Um, but in terms of actually imaging, it's, they're very much the same to work with. Okay, uh, we've got uh, another question. Um, here it is. Um, Brian uh, asking us, where do we see the next five years of medical device development uh, lie uh, in terms of managing biofilm infections? Um, I think um, at the moment, um, people are focusing their efforts very much uh, on changing the surface properties. Uh, uh, to um, sort of uh, mitigate um, um, microbial adhesion to surfaces. Uh, uh, but in the long term, uh, I think that in addition to that, um, there is scope for looking at different uh, therapeutic adjuvants uh, to uh, control biofilm. So it's, it's really clear that at the moment that uh, the traditional antibiotics that we have uh, in the market, uh, they are they're not very good at tackling biofilm infections, but once that there is evidence to say that once this biofilm is disrupted, uh, then those individual cells that have been released from the biofilm, they can be uh, tackled uh, quite easily by our traditional antibiotics. So um, in terms of medical device development, uh, I think changing surfaces um, and in terms of sort of mitigating uh, biofilms on surfaces uh, when these sort of changes are not quite sufficient. Uh, I think uh, looking at therapeutic adjuvants uh, is, uh, is going to be uh, quite big in the next five years. Um, there's another question um, uh, here. Uh, we've been asked if we can explain our staining protocol uh, for the live dead uh, staining. Uh, this is a question from Dr. D. Chen uh, in China. Um, and Nathan, would you like to take this on? Um, so the live dead staining that we carried out was using the backlight live dead staining kit, um, which uses a cytonine green stain, um, which stains nucleic acid, um, as well as a propidium iodide red stain, which um, is only able to penetrate dead cells. Um, so the using both stains together um, and overlaying the images, um, you get a, a green colour around cells that um, are alive. Uh, or around all the cells, and then the red colour overlaid um, shows up the dead cells um, specifically. 
the way we carried it out was to grow up the um, biofilms in you uh, by flowing through media which had the stain in it. Um, so we seeded the, bio, the bioflux, the plates with um, overnight cultures, and then the media flowing through uh, contained uh, both the live and dead stains in it. Um, and we imaged um, each time using the bright field and then uh, a uh, FITSI filter and a um, uh, CY3 oh. filter or a red, a red filter. Um, so we've got another question from uh, Brian. Um, uh, he's asking the question, does um, propidium iodide stain uh, extracellular DNA? Um, from um, the experience that uh, I've had so far, uh, it definitely seems so. Um, uh, this is uh, sort of a, a drawback uh, with the light dead staining kit. Um, mm -hmm. There are specific uh, stains that we could use that are sort of non-DNA based uh, to look at uh, extracellular polymeric substances, which would sort of mitigate um, this problem with the interference with uh, extracellular DNA. Uh, so, uh, so yes, uh, that's that's a that's a very relevant question, and uh, yeah, uh, and there are stains available in the market that can overcome this. I think the other um, aspect of that is that we are looking into um, inserting fluorescent tags into the cells as another way of looking at the biofilm using fluorescence, um, which obviously negates the need for a stain, but it's much harder, requires a lot more effort and time. Um, so, you know, the, the live death stain is much easier for that sort of thing. Um, another question, does the live death stain affect biofilm formation? There is evidence uh, out there in the literature um, to say that uh, it might do uh, in some organisms. Um, uh, that's that's um, that's been published for a few years now. Um, so yes, there is there is evidence, but uh, it doesn't seem to uh, in the uh, in the in the organism that we are working with. So uh, yes, there are drawbacks still, but uh, we're still quite early days in, in in this research. So as Nathan mentioned earlier, we are moving towards fluorescently tagged organisms, um, particularly Protus mirabilis, uh, to use with the bioflux. Uh, okay, uh, we have another question. Um, are we headed towards biofilm destruction uh, or closer to biofilm control over the next five years? Um, personally, uh, I think we would never be able to destroy biofilms uh, because wherever there are microorganisms, they preferentially tend to live in biofilms. Uh, and I think biofilms do uh, when we talk about biofilms, there is a disproportionate focus on the negative impacts of biofilms. So biofilm formation, yes, it causes problems uh, when biofilms grow in places that we don't want them to grow. Uh, but actually, many of the natural uh, positive impacts of microorganisms are due to beneficial biofilms. For example, uh, within water treatment, uh, you want uh, these microorganisms to, that treat the water to be able to survive uh, the harsh conditions that they are exposed to. Uh, so they tend to preferentially form biofilms. So biofilm destruction, I don't think personally, uh, is a good ideal to head towards over the next five years. Um, but I think if we can move closer to biofilm control, uh, that's the holy grail. So we stop them from forming where we don't want them to form, and then we uh, enhance their formation uh, quite predictably uh, in places where we want them to form. So uh, I think in the next five years, a biofilm control is what we should be headed towards. Um, so uh, thank you very much uh, for everyone, uh, to everyone for um, uh, so for staying with us uh, throughout this webinar, for logging in today and for sh uh, showing interest. Uh, and thank you for all the lovely questions around biofilms. Always happy to talk um, about biofilms anytime. Um, and if any of you have any questions, um, 
that come to you uh, later uh, after this webinar, please feel free to get in touch. Uh, I'm very happy to talk about Biofilms and uh, Bioflux 1000Z anytime. Uh, like I said, you've got my email address uh, in the chat function. Uh, you've got the email addresses for um, Brian Haynes from Fluxian Bio, as well as Dr. Andrew Ridley from um, lab tech as well so please feel free to uh, drop us your questions and uh, we will get back to you so um thanks everyone